there, it's Hillary Topper here, and this is a special episode of Hillary Topper On Air. So today, I want to talk about what's going on with this world. It's now the end of April. My birthday is April 25th, so it's this Saturday. And it's a really strange time. It's a really, really strange time. We're all on shutdown. Most of us are in our houses and haven't been out for weeks at this point. I know it's been, the last time I left my house was March 4th. It was the day after the Chef of the Year event from the Queen Center for Progress. And so it's been a while since I left my house and it's given me a time to reflect on things, to reflect on my life, to reflect on where I'm going, to reflect on a lot of different things. And as my birthday approaches, well, let me take a step back and say that April is always a very difficult month for me. It's oh, It always had been, it always was, it always will be. T.S. Eliot wrote in a poem that April is the cruelest month. And I always felt that that was so on target, maybe because the weather is changing and the flowers are starting to bloom and the grass is starting to get green. You would think that it would be a happy time, but instead for some reason, it's a sad time for me. I'm not sure why. I'm not sure why I always felt this way, but I do more so now as I got, I've gotten older than I did when I was younger. And I guess I realized, maybe I realized then that this would happen. When I was born, I was born on my sister Lori's birthday. That was April 25th. I was born in the year 1962. She was born in the year 1958. And my mother, who had my sister when she was only 18 years old, was born on April 26th. So the three of us shared a birthday. And when we were young, my sister, it really bothered her. I think that she felt like I was taking away from her birthday. And, you know, in the beginning, my mother used to have birthday parties for the both of us, which really was a mistake. And then as we got older, we started having separate birthday parties and we started celebrating our birthday separately. When we became adults later in life, then we always set aside a day. Maybe it wasn't the actual day of the birthday, but it was always a day that the two of us would celebrate our birthdays. And when my mother moved down to Florida, we barely spent birthdays with her, but we always celebrated. And my the last time that when I celebrated my 50th birthday was the last time I saw my mother. My mother was very, very sick and she'd always been sick her whole entire life. Um, she had polio when she was a little girl and she also had serious breathing issues. She was overweight and the polio came back later in life when she turned 50 and her bones just broke very easily and she suffered so much from the post polio syndrome and from her asthma and COPD. Um, so it eventually killed her and it was my 50th birthday. That was the last time I actually saw my mother. Um, I had gone there because I felt it was my 50th birthday and I wanted to spend my birthday with my mother. And to my surprise, I was interviewing both my parents at the time. Um, 
they wanted a videotape of their lives. So I was videotaping them. And as I'm videotaping my mom, my sister, Lori, appears in the door and she shouts out, surprise. And it was incredible. I could have cried. I mean, it was just such an amazing moment for me just to be there with my mother and my sister and the three of us got the opportunity to celebrate our birthdays together. And my brother, Ed, um, he's my younger brother. He came with his wife, Andrea, and we all just, you know, and my dad was there and we all had a cake and we sang and it was just, it was just beautiful. It really was beautiful. A couple of weeks after that, um, I was supposed to go there with my kids uh, to Florida to visit my mother. I knew that she was dying. She was on hospice at the time. And she didn't, she didn't make it. She died before I got there. And I ended up actually changing the date of my flight and having my kids come a day later because the hospice people, the hospice nurses called me and told me that my mother was dying and that I should try to get there right away just to see, to say goodbye to her. So I did and I got on a plane and I actually got a call from my sister and she said, Hillary, I'm coming with you. And I said, okay, that's great. And she says, I'm bringing my daughter, Jessica. And I said, okay, that's great. You know, the three of us will hop on a plane and we'll go see mom and we'll say goodbye. And as the plane was in the air, I could see, I look out the window and I see this most amazing rainbow. I had never seen a rainbow like this in my life. It was so magnificent. And at that moment, I knew that my mother had passed. It was just so clear and so transparent to me that she had passed at that point. When we got off, as soon as the plane landed, we got a call from my brother, Ed, saying that my mother had passed and that we, you know, we were too late. So my sister and I were just very distraught, just totally destroyed. I mean, my sister was just, she, she, it was, it was very painful for both of us. Fast forward, my sister and I, we continued the, the tradition of celebrating our birthdays together. And about Six years later, we were invited, actually for the first time, to um, my sister-in-law's house. My sister-in-law, Rebecca, had a party, a, a Passover celebration at her home. And my sister and I um, were invited, and my sister was very grateful because she always felt so left out of family parties because um, she was married to my sister-in-law's husband, Gary, and felt that she was never invited to anything and was always alone for holidays. So this made her so happy. So it's Passover and it's two years ago. So it was 2018 and we, had a fun time. We all drank like we usually do on Passover because there's a lot of glasses of wine you're supposed to drink on Passover. And that was the last time I saw her. That Tuesday after Passover, she called me up and she told me that she passed out in her office, that she had had a fight with a, a colleague and had passed out and she went to the doctor and the doctor said there was nothing wrong with her, 
but she had the worst headache of her life and didn't know what to do. It was so bad, she just didn't know what to do. That, she went back to the emergency room and again, they told her there was nothing wrong with her. She had an appointment the weekend after that Monday, she had an appointment with the neurologist. And when she went to the neurologist, he said that it was just a serious migraine. And he prescribed a series of medications, which I was really concerned about. And she told me what he prescribed. And I was just shocked that this neurologist prescribed so many different medications, including Xanax. And I thought, she's going to overdose. That was the last time I spoke to her. When she came back from the neurologist, she called me and told me what happened. And she said that nothing was helping. And the next thing I know, I get a call from her boyfriend who said, One, you better meet us at Plainview Hospital. Your sister collapsed and she's in the hospital right now. Well, I'm making a long story out of this, but when we got to the hospital, the doctor came in and saw me and saw her two, her two daughters and her boyfriend and said to us, you need to make a decision. We can either operate or we could just let her die. We didn't know what to do. I mean, it was the most horrible, horrendous decision. You know, you had read about stuff like this. You had read about things that happened to people. You had read about these things, but you never thought that they would ever happen to you or your family. And she told us that she had so much damage to her brain that she would never be the same, that she'd probably be a vegetable the rest of her life. So we decided not to operate. And as we decide that we're not going to operate, and this is the most horrendous, difficult decision that we've ever had to experience, she, the doctor comes back into the room and tells us that her, her eyes are responding and maybe there's some hope. Maybe if they do the surgery, she'll be okay. So we all agreed, do the surgery. We want her back. Several hours went by after the surgery. You know, it took several hours for them to do the surgery and we just waited. And as we waited, it felt like years had passed by. Years. I mean, it just felt like a whole lifetime had passed by in that, in that room, in that waiting room while we were waiting for her to get out of surgery. It was like slow motion. Like everything was slow motion. She gets out of surgery and the surgery went well. She goes into ICU and she was there for several weeks. She was on a ventilator. Several weeks go by and they see that she's just not, she's not gonna make it. So they tell us that they're going to take her off the ventilator. She'll probably die in a few minutes. They decide not to take her off the ventilator because they find that she's an organ donor. And the organ donor people, they come in and they try to prep her so that they can get the, the, the organs out of her so that when she does, when she did pass, they would be able to take her lungs and her liver and her heart and, you know, her vitals or kidneys and all that to use for other people. And they told us who they were going to go to and how she was going to be able to help other people. And it sounded, it sounded like even though it was so sad and so horrendous, the whole ordeal, that maybe, maybe there was meaning. So they prep her for surgery. 
and they're going to take out the respirator and unplug her. And they tell her us that if she dies within an hour, they could take out her bodily, her, her organs. But if she lives past an hour, then they'd have to just close her back up and bring her back upstairs. Her two daughters, her boyfriend and I walk into the operating room where he had to scrub <laughs> and wear operating gear. And we played music for her and told her it was okay to go. But she fought. She didn't want to die. She did not want to die. She wanted to be there. She wanted to see her grandchildren. She had just got had a new grandson, her first grandson, and she it made her so happy to have a grandson. And all she wanted was for her grandchildren to know who she was. She didn't die that day. They brought her up to the hospital bed to ICU and they told us that they would put her into um, a hospice type unit a couple of weeks later. I don't even know if it was a week or two weeks later. It just kind of all blurred into one. They took her off of feeding. They took her off of hydration and they gave her morphine and she still didn't die. Our birthdays came. It was her 60th birthday. We were planning on celebrating that 60th birthday by going to Blackstones. We were also planning to go to the wineries over the summer. We couldn't find a date. We could not find a date that would work for both of us. We were both so busy. We couldn't find a time to celebrate her birthday. So we picked a date in the summer and we said we were gonna to go to Blackstone's for the actual birthday. And we made her an appointment there. But instead of going to Blackstone's, I celebrated with her in her hospital bed while she was laid there in a coma. And her daughters decorated the room with happy 60th birthday, mom, it was so sad. And she passed away. So she passed away in May, but that the month of April was a torture month for me. So here we are two years later, my mother's gone, my sister's gone. My dad is, has um, very bad dementia and he's in a, assisted living facility in Florida. And my brother lives down there in Florida as well. I usually try to go away for my birthday. And last year, I went away with my cousin Mindy. We went to St. Petersburg for a long weekend and we had a magnificent time. We really did. It was really, really special. It was my first birthday away from my sister. And she just, she really helped me get through it because it was really rough for me. And I guess every year is rough for me. I mean, it's never going to get easy. It's never going to be the same. But I did write a blog post. Um, I wrote a tribute to Lori Weiss on May 7th, 2018. And I talk about my life with her and I talk about her and her children and her grandchild. And one of the things that I said on the blog was that I learned something here, that I learned a lesson, a valuable lesson. And I think this holds true to what we're all going through right now with the coronavirus and being on lockdown and being scared that we may get infected with COVID-19. There are 
so many deaths and so many people who have it in New York and they don't even know how many people have had it in New York because there's no testing. You know, even though the president says there's testing, there's no testing. You cannot get tested unless you have a fever or you're of a certain age. So getting back to the story about my sister, I did learn a few lessons. And one of the most important lessons I learned is never take advantage of anything in your life. Not your parents, not your siblings, not your spouse, not your friends, not even your children, because you never know what's going to happen. Every day I wake up and I thank God for my life. And I think to myself that I do not have regrets. And if I, I wronged somebody, I try to say I'm sorry. And if I wronged you, I'm sorry. Try to enjoy every minute of your life. Don't let any time pass and take that for granted. Even if you're cooped up in your house, look outside and watch the, the tree blow. Do something. Look at your house and say, thank you for being able to provide this house for myself. And finally, which I still find very difficult is don't stress over little things like not being able to complete a workout or coming in last place in a race or losing a huge job of business or having an argument with somebody because in the end, it's just not worth it. Getting back to April and how I feel about my life and about my past and where I'm going, I'm kind of, I'm feeling melancholy, as you could tell. I'm usually a little bit more upbeat. I'm happy in, in, a, in a crazy way. I'm happy that we're cooped up in our houses because it's giving me the opportunity to reflect, you know, not only on my life, but where I'm going and what I want to do. I mean, I love podcasting and I'm so grateful to have blogs that I could write and express myself in and, 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 and share my experiences with you. And I'm so happy that I wrote this book, Branding in a Digital World, How to Take an Integrated Marketing Approach to Building Your Business. It was a it was a long struggle with the book, but I, I I'm proud of myself for doing it. I'm really proud of myself. It took me only ten years to write my second book, and hopefully it won't take that long to write my third book. And I really appreciate my students, and I absolutely love teaching, and it's just something that I want to do more of. And I love mentoring and helping people helping businesses get to the next level. And I love being there and brainstorming different ideas and strategies for businesses. I find that exciting. I'm passionate about that. So as we end April and as my birthday is here, I just want to say thank you. Thank you to all of you out there for not only listening to this podcast, but for being my friend and for being there when I need you. I do really appreciate all of you and I, and I pray for all of us that we get through this okay and that we all actually come out of this stronger. Thank you for listening. And if you wanna hear any more of our podcasts, you can go to hillarytopperonair.com or you can find us on Spotify, iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, SoundCloud, and even Amazon Alexa. I hope you have a great week. I'll see you 
next time. Welcome to Hillary Topper On Air, the podcast you can't afford to miss.